Hello, my name is Voya and welcome to My Deep Guide. And in today's video, we are doing an in-depth look and a little bit of a guide to the Supernote A6X2, the Crystal Edition. Yes. So this unit was kindly sent to me originally um, by the Rata team as a review loan unit but I have liked it so much that I actually reached out and purchased it for myself. So now this is my own device. So that's full disclosure. Oh, spoilers alert. It's an excellent freaking device. Everybody knows that by now. But in this video, I'm gonna be going in depth into the whole thing and try to cover as many aspects as I can. So it's gonna be a little bit longer than usual. Uh, it's like a call back to my older times. I don't even know how long it's gonna be until I see it in the edit, but well over an hour. So maybe one part, maybe two parts. We'll see when it comes out. This type of work takes a lot of time, a lot of testing, a lot of things. And um, yeah, I don't take any sponsorships. I don't have any sponsored videos. I don't have anything like that. Uh, I have you guys as a support and that means a ton. Uh, also, my independence also means a lot to me and that's why I actually do this. So if you do value the independence of my deep guide and you do like the videos that I do, um, please do like this video, subscribe to the channel, comment because that uh, helps the channel's visibility and the video's visibility. And also if you would like to help directly the cause of independence of my deep guide and the ability to grow even further, then you can go to mydeepguide.com shop and you can check out the MDO or MMP and those are both hyperlinked PDF files. MDO is there to help you organize all of your yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily organizing or journaling needs. And the MMP is the My Deep Guide Meeting Planner, which, help, which helps you simplify, organize and centralize all of your meeting planning needs. Uh, if any of those sounds interesting to you, check out the links in the video description below for the playlists and you have plenty of videos that will tell you exactly what these products are and what they are not. And then you can make an informed decision if any of those are for you or not. And now onwards. And here it is. Again, we're taking a look at the Supernote A6X2 and I have the crystal version here. So before we begin to deep dive into the Supernote A6X and check out all the test results and, you know, impressions that I've had, uh, have gathered over the time that I spent with it. Uh, first things first, what is it? Well, Supernote A6X2 is an e-ink screen powered 7 0.8 inch tablet device. It runs a specialized version of Android 11 on it. You do not have the Google Play Store. You don't have the ability to install your apps or anything like that. It's just the engine underneath everything, but it's a completely overhauled system. So basically when you look at it, it doesn't look anything like Android. As a consequence of them actually having an Android uh, 11 is that you do have an option to actually get some apps. In this case, we have two apps that come with the Supernote OS system, and that is the Kindle and the Atelier, which is an app for drawing. Um, but you don't have the freedom to install or sideload your own apps. These are only the apps that are going to be provided by the Supernote themselves, and you get them by yeah, getting the latest uh, OS update, and then that actually grants access or uh, ships out with another app. So that's that part of the way. Now, what about the e-ink screen thing? Well, e-ink screens are, for those who don't know, they are nothing like OLED or IPS displays. They're actually completely the opposite. The way they work is they have black and white ink cells, which are uh, positively or negatively electrically charged. And by the screen actually changing the orientation of charging, it forces black or white uh, ink cells to move further up towards the surface of the screen, thus forming the image. What are the benefits of an e-ink screen? Well, first of all, they are really, really low power consumption because one of the things, one of the major differences between an e-ink screen and a traditional screen is that the traditional OLED or IPS screen, it consistently has to refresh every single time. And even if the picture is not changing, it has to refresh 60 times a second, 120 times a second, 
sometimes 240 frames uh, uh, times a second and that's basically depending on the specifications of the screen itself this is not true for the e-ink screen e-ink screen reorients and rearranges itself to display an image and unless there's a change it just stays there and theoretically speaking if this device for example if i have it like this and i just took away the power it would remain like that the whole device would be in fact you could be uh, you would be able to actually even disconnect the entire screen from the device and it would still retain the image even though nothing works and that's because of that physical aspect the second thing um, that's also important is um, that they are not backlit screens um, in fact supernote has no light at all it doesn't have a backlight doesn't have a front light so it entirely depends on the environment um, that you are in and that's because e-ink screens are basically reflective screens they reflect the ambient light onto your eyes and thus they eliminate all the bad aspects of a flickering display that flickers in your face all of the time. That also means that you rely on the ambient light so you can't use this in the darkness. You will need some supplemental lighting solution to actually use it. So, this was an introduction for just maybe um, some new users who are uh, maybe have heard of this and they are kind of wondering. With that out of the way, what are the specifications of the A6X2? Well, first about the name, A6X2. This is the first iteration or the successor of their first model, which was called the A6X. And this is not, doesn't have a major uh, components upgrade. It's just a refresh to use newer components that are readily available because the older components are no longer available in the market. So they weren't actually going for chasing like uh, super turbo cores or anything like that. Nope, they just went for what the device, they feel that the device needs in order to perform as well as it can. So with that in mind, the specifications of the A6X2 are, uh, it has a 7.8 inch, as I said, um, uh, a 300 PPI e-ink screen with a resolution 1404 by 1872. And the important part here is that it is a glass panel, but it does have a feel right to self-recovery soft film uh, on a pre-applied and on top. And that's something that's very, very specific for the Supernode devices and they have their own propri proprietary, this is not just a screen protector, of course it serves as a screen protector, but it's also a surface that you write on, hence for those who write. That is the accent and the point of this device. So even though it does have a glass panel underneath it, this surface on top is um, softer, much, much softer, much more giving. And, and the result is that when you're actually writing on this device, it does not feel like you're writing on glass. It actually feels like you're writing on something else. Does it feel like writing on paper? Not to me, but um, more on that a little bit later. Now, as far as the rest of the specifications goes, well, inside it has a um, quad core 1.8 gigahertz CPU. It has four gigabytes of RAM. It has 30, 32 gigabytes of storage, out of which I think you get around 25, 26 gigabytes free because the rest is taken up by the operating system. And it also has a micro SD card, which supports uh, capacity or uh, cards of up to two terabytes. And um, if you have an NTFS format, uh, micro SD card you can just slot it in and it just works um, so you can see here that I have a micro SD card here and if I power up the system you can see it here sun disk blah 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 card and I go here and I have access to all of my SanDisk uh, files that are on SanDisk SD card. Battery is 2700 milliamps. We'll talk about battery life when we get to that section. And you have the standard USB 3, uh, USB-C connectivity. You have uh, dual band Wi-Fi. You have Bluetooth 5.0. As I said, you have the uh, Android 11 that is their own version. Um, and weight wise, it's 266 grams because this is a full on plastic device. So it's a very portable uh, digital notebook and it's a device that is meant for those who write. And this, I know that companies, a lot of times they just put up a slogan and that's it. But this is one of the rare cases where that slogan just kind of sticks in your mind because more you write on and more you use this device, 
more this thing just keeps popping up and that's a testament to the focus that the development team had behind this device because they truly made it uh, yeah, an ideal device for those who write. This is not a cheap device, especially not for a small uh, uh, portable format or a 7.8 inch device. And depending on which configuration you go for, you're looking at either from 427 US dollars for the device, the standard uh, cheaper pen and the magnetic uh, faux leather folio. And it can go all the way up to 473 US dollars if you go again for the uh, uh, for the crystal version so the previous price is for the white uh, version of the device this is the crystal version where you can see through in the back more on that a little bit later um, so for the crystal version with the heart of metal 2 pen and the which is a premium pen and uh, this the same leather uh, full leather cover uh, then it's like 473 us dollars but that being said you also have to add on top the shipping costs and depending on the region where you are maybe even import costs and that balloons the price of this device quite quite high up so now let's check out the device itself and yeah the build quality and the layout of itself and it is something that I find very, very unique, especially the crystal version. So we're first going to start uh, cover the front and the sides and then focus on the on the obvious thing here. It's a flush screen, screen fl completely flush with the surface and the distance from the surface where you're writing on down to the screen is actually less than one millimeter, which makes it really, really nice and it feels really good when you're writing on it because it feels that you're connected more to the surface that displays the content that you're creating. We have an equally spaced uh, bezel around the screen, which is not white, but it's off-white grayish kind of color that almost matches the screen, which is a really, really nice addition and that creates something that's really good. However, um, because this device is equipped with an <laughs> accelerometer, which means that it has auto rotation, I think one of the really, really important aspects is that the uh, the borders um, are equal on left and right, top and bottom, depending on how you orient it. So it doesn't matter really how you orient it, if you're lefty, if you're righty, none of it actually matters because no matter what you do, the device will be symmetrical and therefore it will be very, very nice to use. Now, obviously we also have something that's fairly uncommon uh, on, uh, on these devices. And these are these two vertical stripes here. This is not just decoration. These are touch stripes and they or uh, they actually can be used and are used for specific gestures. So for example, if I want to access a menu and I simply swipe down this axis, it will give me the menu. If I want to manually refresh the screen, I will manually refresh the screen. And this one also has an undo and redo functionality. And it actually varies between um, different uh, states of the device. So if you're reading a document, you can use it to uh, swipe, uh, swipe through pages, you can swipe individually, you can swipe actually a lot, and things like that. And also in you can make it as an undo redo. As a functionality, they're unique, and they're really good. However, uh, some users did report, not many, actually, if I'm fair, one, I had one like super venting email that I received where the person was uh, commenting that they couldn't get uh, to the grips of working with this device when writing or annotating in landscape uh, mode and that their palm would inadvertently uh, trigger undo and redo operations. So. I personally haven't really experienced that when I was using it, but this is an entirely subjective thing and it really depends on a gazillion factors, uh, how you hold your hand on the uh, screen when you're writing. Uh, do you hold the entire pen, palm on it? Do you slide with the palm continuously? Do you maybe rest your uh, palm, actually not the palm, but on the little finger so that your touch is actually a lot smaller. So that really depends on your writing habits and writing style. So I don't think that there's a one glove fit all solution, but what uh, would be good is if we would have an option to actually um, turn this off or maybe improve it in some way that it actually detects that, hey, when I detect there's a palm on my screen, well, then I'm not going to read this. 
you know so right now does it read it yes it does so i think that that would be an easy solution maybe um that maybe somebody wants to kind of try out or something but that's something that you should be aware of that while these two stripes they're super efficient and really really good and i personally have not run into the, any issues with them there is at least one person out there that has and that's worth mentioning on to the other stuff regarding device well we have nothing on either side of the device um, there's nothing on the bottom actually everything for this device is located on the top here so and everything that you have is because this is a very minimalistic and simplistic device you got a USB-C and a power button that's it this is for those who write it doesn't have speakers it doesn't have a microphone it doesn't have anything it just has a LED here indication which lights up when you're charging the device to give you an indication is it charging or is it charged and that's it so it is a super focused no nonsense very very discreet and very uh, yeah <laughs> no distractions type of a device fully now we flip it onto the back and we have a completely different story than any other device that we currently have on the market, especially with this crystal version, which actually shows without any shame what this device is. The focus that Arata wanted to uh, achieve with the Supernote A6X2 and their X2 line is basically uh, easily repairable and serviceable devices. So one of the biggest problems with any of the devices that are out on the market is that if your battery dies, uh, after I don't know five years something like that and you want to change it you can't you got to go to a specialist they have to heat the screen remove it and blah 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 blah. all of these things didn't used to be like that at least like 10 15 years ago you could just pop the back cover off and you know uh, recycle the old battery pop in the new battery pop the cover up back up and that's it somewhere along the line when you know iPhone 1 came out everybody started doing the same thing and here we are today and I'm really really happy to actually see this coming back as a thing and this is going to be a requirement in European Union very very soon which is a great thing so it's really really good to see that Rata is one step ahead of the curve and they are not reacting but they are this is a proactive type of a solution which is great to see now one thing that's important to mention is that as far as practicality goes the access to these uh, to the battery and most importantly to the SD card slot because the SD card slot is down here you don't have the standard thing you have to actually open up the whole thing in this uh, version the white version is actually more practical because because it doesn't have any of the screws that the crystal version has it actually has a panel plastic panel that you just simply pop off and then you do what you need to do and you pop it back up so you don't need the tools you don't need anything like that that is not the case with the crystal uh crystal even though it's really really gorgeous and striking i really love how this feels it just makes it feel special and really nice it is objectively a pain in the butt to uh, unscrew let's see one two three four five six seven fourteen uh 16 18 screws you gotta screw them off uh to take the cover off then the power button uh, will fall out because it's not really fully held and the magnets are not really going to be there kind of jiggly and stuff only to be able to actually put in the SD card in there or to remove it or to swap it um, the problem of taking cover off on the crystal version it's not a big problem the big problem is actually uh, putting it all back together and there's only like a handful of specific ways that you can do it and it's not for the faint of heart and the main issue is actually this power button which as soon as you it doesn't have any mechanism here to hold it in place it's you have to just slot it into the hole and then while it's there in the hole you need to pop the rest of the device in and hope that the magnets don't fall off because they also don't have anything to kind of fully hold them so the whole uh, shebang of taking it apart and doing stuff it's fun it's nerdy and I love that aspect I absolutely love the aspect that I know that I can take the back off and I can replace the parts if they get broken because it's not just the battery you know you have the battery you have the main board here you have one screw for the power switch so if your power switch dies then you can simply order a replace replacement power switch it arrives you disconnect you take the cover off 
take the screw off, disconnect it, put the new one in, put the screw in and it will work. Which for example, unfortunately Remarkable 2 users, they get completely stuck if their device falls or if the button actually gets stuck inside, which is a very, very, very common thing with the Remarkable 2, then they have to send the whole device back and get it refurbished. It's a whole ordeal. Um, whereas with this kind of approach, you, you don't have that issue. So overall, I think this is like a really, really excellent approach and a gorgeous thing to see, especially the crystal version. It's just so pretty. And the way that it's made, I mean, it just makes so much sense. You have this beautiful indentation here where the magnet is for the cover, but it's not just magnet. You have this physical indentation as well. So that it holds both a little bit physical and with the magnetic forces. And it's again, perfectly symmetrical here as well. Fit and finish is absolutely perfect. And the manufacturing is uh, incredibly precise. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think about it. You have a device that's all plastic that uh, needs to fit so well that it, but it also needs to be really easy to dismantle because once you take these screws off, the cover just lifts. You don't have to push anything. You don't have to pull anything. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything. However, when you put it back in, there's no real gaps here. I mean, the design and the margin of errors here are really, really good. And furthermore, unlike, for example, on the Tab Ultra, any of them, Ultra, Ultra C, Ultra C Pro, the bucket design is perfectly in line. So when you're writing, you don't really actually feel any difference between the edge of the uh, device and the screen and the bucket that it actually goes in. On the Ultra C, for example, those were poking out and because these, they were metal, they were really, really uncomfortable. So the build quality and the design of the uh, Supernote A6X2 is exceptionally good with one uh, negative, and that is uh, actually two negatives. And that is for the crystal version, it is very cumbersome to go through the entire process just to have access to the micro SD card slot. So if you're one of the users who wants to have tons of libraries on different micro SD card slots, then I think that you should consider taking the white version because taking the panel off and changing the SD card slot is way, way easier and you can do it on the run. Whereas with the uh, crystal version, it's an event. And it's an event. And the second negative point is the uh, power button itself, not the switch, but the button plastic one that triggers the switch. Um, that one should have been designed in a way that it actually can be easier to assemble back together because you do want, because of this micro SD card slot, the assumption is that the user will need access to and will disassemble their device uh, much more often than just for the need of changing a battery, changing a hardware component. And it's mainly just because of where and how the micro SD card slot has been um, yeah, engineered to be where, where it is. But other than that, that is the only negative that I have. And that's only for the crystal version. For the white version with the panel, you don't have any of that. You don't care about the button. You don't care about this because you have panel you, you take off and that's it. So that is an important consideration to kind of keep in mind. If you're not going to use an SD card slot or, or change them, or you just want to put in a big one, like two terabytes and you're done with, well, then it's not a big deal because you do it once and you're done. But again, something that needs to be mentioned. Overall, exceptionally good build quality, um, especially because it's plastic. I mean, I can't really get over too much over that because there's no bending, there's no uh, imprecisions. It's just, and it also feels like a really, really high quality device, which it has to because of the price range as well. And the really cool thing about the crystal is that because it's transparent, and it's an already thin device and a really, really nicely balanced device to hold in a hand. But the crystal one, because it's transparent, it just gives you an illusion that it's even thinner than it is. And it just feels like a really nice slate to kind of use. And it's just, I don't know, it just feels and looks special and I love it for it. As far as the screen itself goes, well, it's a normal uh, looking screen and it just works um, yeah, the way you would expect it for an e-ink screen. Now, if you're not used to an e-ink screen, e-ink screens are slow. 
that's that's just way 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 slower they are not they're intended for a very specific type of use and as such they should never be actually compared to a traditional oled or an ips screen because that's apples and oranges here so for anyone who's interested this is how an e-ink screen normally functions this kind of refreshing things and that's because of those white and black cells that i was talking about they need to rearrange themselves to form a new image the responsiveness of the device is really good and something that has been improved quite quite considerably from the a6x because my fingers um, usually i had some issues with the uh, responsiveness and gesture recognition and I've noticed that on the a6x2 for whatever reason is it to feel right to is it the new screen is it everything new um, but the end result is that um, yeah my gestures are easily recognized and I don't really have any issues that I had with the a6x before so that's something that's really really nice and it's like super super easy to navigate and to read now the cool thing is that we have the auto rotation mode here so if you swipe down from up you get the um, toolbar system toolbar and if I enable auto rotation that means that you know the screen will flip to a landscape mode which will naturally give me a much more zoomed in look of the whole thing and once i am in that view the really cool thing is that you, you have some gestures so you can double tap with two fingers to show and hide the toolbar for example if you want you can double tap at the bottom here to show and hide the uh, page numbers and things like that but when you're in landscape format the really cool functionality of it is that you see these little fingers here your swipe gestures now will first slide the page all the way to the bottom and the fingers show you where you were previously so that you don't have to hunt around you just have a visual indication to continue reading and then another swipe gets you to another page and etc etc and then you can navigate in a very very nice way and that actually transforms the small format of the a6x2 because objectively if i look at it like this this text for example for this specific document it's really really tiny and not really comfortable to read even though the screen is fairly sharp as you can see it's sharp enough that you can show everything you know content is really really good but with a simple flip here now it displays basically as an a5 device a much larger device but still in this portable format and I don't have to do any special settings I don't have to do anything the only thing that I had to do was turn the auto rotation on that's it the device and the operating system they're handling everything for me and my use and interaction with the device remains the same i'm simply flipping the pages and reading uh, the same as i would and i do in a portrait mode so my interaction it remains the same and the device and the operating system handles the rest and that's how you want these things to be and that's part of the minimalism and simplicity and the maturity of the operating system that we have here on the uh on the super note and yeah for reading purposes i really really like how it works it just kind of feels really really good now as far as the image quality and control goes let me zoom in so that you can actually see how it looks like all right so this is the maximum zoom that i could uh, get on the camera and for reference purposes here is the tip of the pen and here is the tip of my finger just to see how tiny this text actually is but despite it being super tiny it is very very legible and very very easily readable and i like the precision the contrast and everything about it and it is able to easily display and handle both images or icons and the text in different formatting and if you're interested in just the text here's a little bit of a example of a wall of text and now let's go on to a different document which has which is a graphic heavy one so that we can see how that looks like and in order to do that we can just simply tap the top icon here which gives us back into the folder where the documents are right where we access this document in this case i'm going to open uh, this one which is really really uh, graphics rich document so that you can see what the performance is like what the images are like so we do have a lot of color banding here so it would be nice to actually see some color dithering up, uh, applied here so that we don't have these kind of color banding 
artifacts here. Um, granted, that's not the focus of the device, but still it would be a good thing to have because it would yeah, just render the images more beautifully and more faithfully. But you can see the performance, how it works and how it refreshes. Um, we don't really see any ghosting here because the way it's dealing with this is, there we go, this is the hardest one that you can actually get because you have white block, black block and a darkish black thing and then you switch over to mainly dark thing and then you have a little bit of ghosting. But the ghosting is really not that much and plus if you do have ghosting you have a swipe up, refresh and ghosting is gone. So that is again the benefit of uh, having that manual refresh. So literally at the fingertips of your hand. As far as the image quality goes, I think that it's really, really good. Um, the only thing for me is that contrast by default is a little bit too dark and too, too stark for this type of uh, document. So what you need to do is you can always go into the toolbar, you go into the dots here for the more options and you go into the contrast uh, control and here, oh, that's actually the lowest contrast setting. So that's uh, that's very st strong uh, for my taste. I think that the lowest contrast could be even lower because it's really, really stark right now. So maybe some kind of uh, calibration would be nice because the super high contrast here, yes, it's there, but it's going to lose all of the images here. So yeah, but if you do want contrast control, you do have it right there. So it's not system wide, it's uh, reserved for the uh, reader app itself. Let's uh, go through some more pages so that you can see how the rendering and the performance of the device are and it just looks really good so let's flip it over to here and see what do we get now well now it actually the performance seems to remain the same regardless of how yeah it's not really that much better or worse depending on what i do but what i really like is that it just once the image is stabilized it just looks like an image however that color banding is something that uh, I believe could be improved. And the contrast, the minimum level of contrast is way too dark. I mean, this uh, there's a lot of details that are lost here. So for those purposes, yes, it looks striking because it's high contrast, but my preference is, yeah, a little bit less contrast and more details. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something that would be nice to actually see. Now let's find a particularly trying uh, oh this looks very nice <laughs> this looks really pretty there we go this is very very challenging so let's zoom in so that you can see how the screen handles a situation like this all right so this is a very challenging situation for the screen and i'm going to manually refresh so that we have a full uh there we go uh, so now we have a clean image of what the device can display and why is it challenging where we have a lot of black and white and gray as a background we have uh yeah different shade of gray here for the uh, uh text here as a title then we have a black transparent box on top and then white text on top of all of that and that's a lot that's a big ask for um, yeah, a monochromatic device, especially an e-ink screen to actually deliver because there's a lot of room for imprecision or kind of that it can become mushy. But as we can see here, that doesn't really happen. Even in the, the portrait mode, which this is in, where everything is super small, as you can see, the, the size of everything, um, it's still completely legible, even from a bigger distance where I'm sitting now. I think there's like uh, probably 70 centimeters, maybe 80 centimeters between where my eyes are and um, the, the display here. And I'm able to easily actually read all of this even without my glasses. So yeah, the image quality is really, really good. Uh, the only thing is that it could definitely benefit from uh, the addition of image dithering and also the calibration of the contrast control so that we can have lower contrast as a lowest setting.
As far as the battery life goes, it has a 2700 milliamp battery, which is a slightly, slightly smaller battery than what we had on the A6. X, the regular one, which had 2,900 milliamps. So I was wondering, like, what is that going to do to the power consumption generally? Because while it does have a smaller battery, it does have newer components, which are less battery hungry, right? So maybe that equalizes and maybe there's a reason what they did. And actually it turns out that yes, there is a reason and there is a logic to what they've done because in order to actually measure and compare this, I had to do the battery test for the A6X as well. I had that device before uh, I started the battery measurement test. So I did my standard battery measurement tests. The battery measurement that I do is real world usage, such as I turn the device on and then I flip pages manually, yes, manually, every 20 seconds for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then uh, measure the starting and the uh, finishing uh, percentage of the battery and then extrapolate the average that way. And as for the reading test and for the writing test, I write for an hour continuously without stopping and then do the same measurement. And the results are actually interesting because the battery consumption and battery life is exactly the same on both the A6X and the A6X2, despite the A6X2 having a slightly smaller battery. So that efficiency of the newer components is definitely there showing up its head. And the battery results are as follows. Since there's no front light on this device, there's only one test to do. So front light off because it doesn't have it. Uh, the reading performance was a 4% of battery life per hour on both the devices, which averages at around 25 hours per charge of continuous reading time and flipping pages. Now that's over a day of continuous reading. Nobody does that. So if you extrapolate that to like, I don't know, four hours of reading, you're gonna get uh, a pretty, pretty good st uh, stint out of this device or the A6X for that matter. And as far as writing, when writing in a standard notebook, it was 10% and that amounts to, uh, on both devices and then amounts to the average of 10 hours per charge of continuous writing in a standard notebook on the A6X2 or on the A6X. And my guideline is anything over eight hours is excellent because this is continually writing. So that performance is really, really good for this, especially for a device that is so thin, so light, and so efficient. It's really, really cool to actually see that. I didn't do the measurement of the handwriting recognition uh, notebooks because that one, uh, I think that it should consume more battery, but at that point I got sick and then kind of everything derailed and then I had to continue and I really didn't feel doing another hour writing because I had a Note Air 3 to write on, so I didn't do that. Maybe I'll do that at some point, but this is the general uh, battery life consumption. So. Yeah, battery life consumption on the A6X2, despite the slightly smaller battery, it's exactly the same as on the A6X, and the results are pretty, pretty good. Now, before we dive deep into the functionalities of um, yeah, the reading and writing and all that kind of stuff, let's talk a little bit more about the hardware side of things, and we'll need to address the pens that you actually have a, available for uh, the Supernote as a platform. Now, here's the thing. Um, the Supernote as a platform has this feel right uh, soft self-recovery surface on top, which means that it's not a standard uh, screen protector and it's not plastic and it's not glass. It's something different. And that uh, allows Rata to actually employ and use ceramic nibs in their pens. Now the ceramic nibs are, there's several benefits to them. The number one is they are far, far more precise at 0.3 millimeters than any other soft felt tip that you may find. The soft felt nibs are much thicker and they wear out over time and they lose precision over time. The ceramic nib does not do any of that and also it doesn't spend because it is harder than the surface that you're writing on. So that means that you do not have to spend any money throughout the lifetime of your device to buy any additional nibs or you don't ever actually change nibs or ink or anything like that. It's just a pen 
that will always work. Now, because of this really cool combination that you have a really rounded and very well manufactured ceramic nib on a pen and a self recovery uh, screen surface, which is the feel right too in this case, that is designed to work with this. This means that you can safely use this hard ceramic nib on this device and that would not necessarily be safe on any other device. So for example, if you were to use this on a Remarkable 2 or on a, a Note Air or on a, any other device that doesn't have this, uh, you run the risk of either directly scratching the screen or scratching the screen protector if you do have a screen protector on top. So I don't recommend using these because it's physics 101. Ceramic is harder than the surface that you're writing on and then the surface that's softer will get scratched. It's not a case of if it will be. It will the only question is when. So if you want to run that risk, that's that's on you. But this is not something that's going to happen with Supernote because of that screen, specially developed screen surface, which is feel right too. So you have the benefit of precision and never needing to change your ceramic nibs. Um, these are, of course, uh, pressure sensitive pens. They are not tilt. Uh, they don't uh, recognize tilt. And here's another misconception. The tilt recognition is not not down due to the pen, it's down due to the Wacom layer underneath and the Wacom layer that's actually reading how much of the contact surface do you have that because if you angle the surface more then you will have a larger surface being recognized by the Wacom layer and then it understands and interprets that into an angle. So when you're vertical your contact point is going to be a singular point and as you actually increase the angle the uh, single point extends into a line or whatever that is detected by the layer. And that's how tilt functionality works. So technically speaking, we may see that at some point if they really wanted to. And I think that they might want to with the addition of the Atelier um, uh, app that they've added for drawing. I think that that's something that's needed. Before the addition of that app, you didn't really need the tilt detection, but now with that you do. So as far as the ceramic nib pens that you have, this is the standard pen that we get with the uh, Supernote. And it's really cool because it has the clicker on the back and yeah, it protects the nib, it's retracted and it's also a normal pen. And again, we go back to for those who write because you just take it, you write, you're done, that's it. I love that as an access. It's really, really nice. And I love that you, I, you don't have to have an additional cap or anything to pre protect it, etc., etc. Um, so that as a concept is really good. The pen is of this kind of ivory like uh, whitish, very shiny type of thing. My problem with it is that uh, there's, there's a couple of issues that I have with this pen. First is the aesthetics. Um, the colors don't match at all. So if this was going to be the first pen that was going to be released, it should have been um, this color. It should have been the gray color that it matches this device and then it would be great. This way, it doesn't match. It doesn't match the device and it, it doesn't match the cover. So color matching, it's just completely off. It doesn't match the whole storyline. And that's something that I think was a missed opportunity. The second thing is that while I do like that it's very light and really nicely balanced. So if you put it in a hand, it's basically perfectly balanced. It doesn't want to go anywhere. It's yeah, if you put it, uh, so let's see, this is the balance and I can just pick up. There's very few pens that you can so easily do that. And because it's super lightweight, you don't really feel it. And it's super easy to write with it. However, the second negative for me is it's very clacky and this back definitely clacks and this clacks. So when you're writing, you get a lot of kind of clackiness and um, that is also further exasperated by this big big uh, plastic tube which is mostly hollow and it just acts as a resonator that amplifies and changes the clacky sound which then kind of comes through these holes here and then you can hear the clackiness coming out of this constantly and a little bit of 
rattliness there. So if those are the things that do bother you, then you need to be aware of them. I'm perfectly aware that some people are going to say like, yeah, I don't care. And there's going to be people who say like, hey, I love that. It's just that I need to cover it so that you know what it is and what it actually, uh, what you're going to be getting. Now, if you don't want any of those, you have this far more expensive and exclusive and much, much better quality uh, pen which is the Heart of Metal 2 pen, uh, which is made, I believe, out of magnesium entirely. So this is an all metal affair. It has a very, very tight cap that goes like this. And uh, same ceramic nib, there's no difference. The same driver is here, but the feel of it is completely different. And it not only feels more superior, but it also does give you a little bit more precision because of how it is in the hand and here there's no clackiness at all so it's just a far more refined experience overall and because the whole thing is a lot more massive and a lot more tighter it just feels a lot tighter therefore it gives me at least i don't know if it's going to be for you but it for me it gives a lot more precision when writing uh, the bad thing is that um, neither of these have an eraser so this does not double as an eraser this is just the physical clicker here and the heart of metal 2 does not have an eraser but supernote does have a um, ace up its sleeve however i would have preferred if the heart of metal 2 um, at least had a pressable button like the Lamy, Lamy pen has or the Samsung pen has that I use or the Samsung Scribe pen has. Um, yeah, that you can actually use because Supernote has a programmable uh, um, option for that, that you can use that extra button as a lasso or a region eraser, which just makes things a lot more easier. But fortunately, we don't have that. And I think that yeah, that's that's something that I'm always missing on the Heart of Metal 2 pen. So I resort to using actually a second pen that does have a button, even though it gives me an inferior writing uh, experience. This is definitely superior, but I rely on that functionality of the button. So I end up not using the Heart of Metal 2 or this one because of the clackiness. That being said, that's just my personal preference. In reality, um, both are excellent pens and they really, really work well. And as I said, a Supernote does have gestures that allow you to hmm, maybe relatively painlessly uh, do erasing. More on that a little later. The only thing that's remaining with the pen is uh, how does it slot in? Well, you have this little pen hook pen loop on the cover and they both have that cover here with a heart of metal i tend to use it like this that the pen uh, cover uh, remains there and i basically just pop it back in and when i need it i use it like this and then when i want to set it down i set it down like this which is not something that you can do with the standard pen so the convenience of this is there but you need to take off the pen click it then write it then click it back and put it back in so Mix and match depends what your preferences are, but those are the two uh, ceramic nibbed uh, pens that you have as an option. And you also have an option of using the Lamy Star pen and the dual pen as well, which has an ink and uh, EMR, but I don't have either of those so that I can really show it to you. But these two are the special ones because they have the ceramic nib tops. And while we're talking about the hardware stuff, let's cover the cover. Haha, <laughs> did not act actually intent that one but I like that it turned into a pun because puns are great um, so we get this really really beautifully made uh, white for now it's just white and I think there's a blue one but there's no blue ones are no longer available so it's only the white one that you have and it's super white it's very glaring uh, but the thing that's that I find interesting is that I've been using this now for a while and it's and I haven't really paid attention to keep it super squeaky clean or anything like that and it has been handled with hands normally right this and like everything it has been standing on desks of different you know kind of uh, uh rooms and even though it's pure white it still hasn't gotten dirty i'm i'm pretty sure that it is gonna get dirty at some point it has to because it's pure pure white but all i'm saying is that after a month or so of use still hasn't gotten dirty and the second thing that i think remains to be seen is well um, now it's winter time here in norway and yeah we're under a mountain of snow well once the summer and sun actually comes maybe in a couple of months 
And it's gonna be interesting to see how does this react when it's exposed to the sun. Will it yellow? Will it not? Or something like that? Because sunshine can yellow white things uh, quite often. That's actually what happens. So that's something I'm curious about what's gonna happen. As far as the design and the build quality goes, it's exceptionally good. These here are magnets that are used to hold the device in place. But you can see that they're uh, pretty massive and they're sticking out quite a while a lot and that fits into this groove here and that makes it a combination of a magnetic and a mechanical hold and that means that once it's in first of all it's super easy to put it in and it makes this really satisfying full click sound when it's in so this is on a cover that's enabled with the auto sleep and auto wake up so now it sleeps and then it wakes up so that works there's no flap to keep the cover uh closed so that's something that uh, yeah uh, you will kind of keep have to keep in mind for me it doesn't really bother me it just works and you can flip it back and it just works well um, but the main benefit is just how easy it is to take the device out and then use it outside of the cover and then you just pop it back into the cover and that's it. In terms of the magnets, how firmly they hold it, they hold them really, really tight. So the only way that I can actually get it off is to be even then, eh, I have to do a very specific thing of under an angle and then lift to basically try and somehow force the magnet to let go, one of the magnets let go and then the other one will, but it holds the device really, really firmly in place and I think that it covers it really, really nicely. Now, this is just a flipbook cover. This is not a protective case, but even as such, has been designed in such a way that it uh, extrudes uh, away from the edges of the device, which means that falls, there we go. So that was a fall and it will pop out the device. Let's do it again and see. Okay, so from a fall, it will release the device. Yes, but as you can see, the device actually works normally. So this uh, is something that you can't really avoid with magnets because you have a mechanical force of that, but it actually protects the device. This edge here around it, it will protect the device up to a point. While I really, really love how this is done and it's far more practical, it is really, really practical to use. The old version had a physical slit here that you would slide in and then the device was physically connected to your cover and it would never fall off. So that is something that we no longer have, but we do have this added super, super level of convenience. And the cover itself I think is really well designed and inside you have this lovely, lovely, plushy, soft, gray, fuzzy kind of surface, which is beautiful to the touch, to kind of cover and hold it. And overall, as just an overall package, it's, um, yeah, we're coming back to those. For those who write, oh, this is a dope notebook, right? That's just, it looks like a notebook, except that you open it up and you're ready to start writing and doing your thing. So overall, an excellent package, doesn't add too much to the weight, doesn't add too much to the thickness, adds a lot of practicality and a decent level of protection. All right, so let's get on to the general operations and from there on I'm gonna jump into the document overview and what you can do with the document. So basically when you start using Supernote, um, the, this is this swipe down here, this is the thing that gives you access to the, um, that's your home screen, so to speak. Because here you can access your recent files, you can instantly create a new note, which will place it in the the root of the notes uh, uh, folder. Um, then you have uh, shortcuts to the last opened note, last document, quick access, which is excellent because you can sort it and you can form it into your own way so that you can have quick access for the documents and notebooks that you're continually using. And then you have shortcuts here, which are rearrangeable. You can rearrange these and you can add or remove whatever you, not whatever, but what you want where. And you have access to your files, which is basically your directory structure um, and access to files of the uh, super note. Then you have the digest, which is basically where all of, I haven't done anything yet on here, but this is um, where all of the, uh, 
annotations and markings that you do in your document where they will appear and then you can search through them and easily access them and go through them. Have a mailbox application which can be hooked up to an Outlook, um, a Gmail or yeah whatever that you're using you can actually hook it up. You have calendar which is an excellent uh, tool for you to kind of organize. It doesn't synchronize with Google Calendar, it doesn't synchronize with Apple Calendar or anything like that. It's its own thing. But it does have the ability to add a new note for the day, you can add the events, you can have all of these things, most of the things that you can repeat with, that you would expect. This is a weekly view and then we have the daily view as well with the numbers here so that you can write your uh, stuff that you want and you can you know f easily flip to the previous and next uh, days so um, it is a nicely functional thing and for example if this is now I'm on Monday and let's say that um, yeah here on Monday I want to add a new note and then it's just gonna tell me okay so you want to add a new note yes I do and I'm gonna add it um, example note and then it's gonna recognize my handwriting recognition here so that I don't have to type but if you want to type you can just go back here and then you can type it normally but if you don't want you just hit this one and then you can uh, do the handwriting recognition so that it is there so once I'm creating a note you can choose to between standard and real-time recognition notes uh, standard notes they have um, certain set of functionalities real-time recognition have a little bit less of functionalities but they have the ability to uh, uh, convert your handwriting recognitions and they are also searchable which the standard ones are not and also real-time recognition will consume a little bit more battery so those are things that you need to kind of keep in mind um, but yeah when creating a notebook you have the option to choose uh, what type you want as far as the handwriting recognition uh, languages go these are the ones that I have here but you can add and this is a list of languages that you can choose from. So please pause and check what it is that you want because there's seven pages of them. I'm just gonna show all seven pages so that you know what it is that you can actually use. It's a fairly, fairly extensive list. There we go. So those are the things that you can, uh, yeah, that you can choose. Then I can choose my templates and you have far more than just these. You can have view all templates and then we have three pages worth of pre-installed templates. And you also have the ability to go through your uh, uh, categorizations of underlines or lines, squares, specialization and customization is basically something that allows you that you can add any template that you want into note templates folder um, on the device and you will be able to use them yeah, as your own templates. So no hacking or anything else. For this, let's use a eight millimeter standard ruled and we just go create. And now that it's created, I'm just gonna say um, this, okay, that was from my desk test. <laughs> let's make it uh, thinner. So 0 0.3 is what I usually use. And then I can use a shortcut. So now how did I actually make an erase? Well, if you have, you can set it up in the settings, but you can use two fingers on the right hand, uh, on the left hand uh, stripe bar, and that will be an eraser gesture. And then I can use two fingers here for on the screen for the selection. So even though I don't have a button, you do have, that's the shortcuts that I was talking about that you can actually use. So um, this is my example note for the calendar okay and now that I'm done I can go back to calendar and once I'm back in the calendar uh, view notes total but actually it doesn't show you anything because you need to create an event only the events are gonna be shown here and to create an event you can go to plus here and these are the options that you have. So starts, then, ends, then, and you can have a description. So, and then event 
and then the typing is actually okay. So once you create that, then it will mark as a little dot that you can see here, and that will carry over through different uh, yeah, uh, things, and the, this is where your event actually shows up. So it's a fairly complete kind of uh, solution, and they can view your notes, and they can choose the notes that are associated with that day. So uh, without my intention being, <laughs> I went into the calendar and explained the whole calendar, but at least that's out of the way now. So that's the default calendar that you have as functionality. The main functionalities, uh, as i shown, you have the swipe down here, you have the right hand swipe here uh, for the menu, you have the full refresh and uh, the functionality of the sidebar. If I go into the settings and I go to the display and input, you have uh, the various different settings. You can choose language, keyboard, uh, yeah, because you can add different languages, uh, keyboards here. Um, and uh, yeah, let's cover the languages. This is the list of languages that you have for virtual keyboards or uh, hardware keyboards. So these are the languages that you can use for keyboards, but you also have the settings for the stylus and you can calibrate your uh, stylus. But if you have a pen that does have a side button, this is where you set up what the side button is going to do. So the side button can function either as a lasso, which is something that I prefer, or a region eraser. Then you have the gestures and you have the um, gesture guide, which is very, very uh, useful. You have left hand dominance, right hand dominance, and you have the eraser and lasso preferences. And basically, yeah, how do you want this to actually work? So press and hold the left sidebar with two fingers to activate region eraser and press and hold the screen with two fingers to activate lasso, right? So those are the customizations that you can have, but you don't have an option to turn off this if your palm rejection is giving you issues. And that I think is something that's missing, something that should be added. And additionally, you have also the ability to add your own custom screensaver. So this was a uh, doodle of Bender that I did um, when I was testing this one. And that means that now when I shut it down, I have my doodle as my own sp uh, sleep screen. So that allows you to actually customize the device to be entirely your own. You can access settings from uh, both the top menu here or there it doesn't matter it's going to be the same thing and you have a ton of options here so you have for the synchronization you can use the super note cloud or dropbox or google drive and this is where you have the direct transfer option so that you can directly transfer via wi-fi from your uh, um, from your browser your battery preferences here it's a really good idea to keep this no load shutdown on because it basically allows the device to go into super low power state and then it extends the battery life for quite a while and you don't really feel it. The The first gesture in the first, first interaction is going to be m delayed by a minuscule amount and that's only for the device to basically wake up and continue working. Uh, but other than that, it just shows you the image that you have and all that kind of stuff. So it's a really, really cool thing to have. Apps, and this is basically, it's gonna show only the apps that are not installed, but since I have them installed, both of them that are available, they're there. Then you have your settings for uh, the Kindle, so you can uninstall it and stop it. You can uninstall and stop the Atelier. Um, then you have the customization of the sidebar. That's what I was talking about. That's this one here. So where these appear and which ones you want to have or not. So you can, everything except files can be removed. So you can make it uh, into a super, super focused device with, so for example, I'm not using mail ever. And I'm actually not using calendar. And now that I've shown it, I can remove it. Um, but I do use digest and I will use these to show you these things. So now that they've been uh, kind of removed, that is directly reflected in here. So those things uh, you definitely can customize. It's a really nice thing to have. Then you have direct access to sending a feedback, a bug report or something like that from your device. And you also have the support. Um, I'm not a fan of this. This used to be access to the user manual directly from the device and now it's been replaced by a QR code that gets you to um, web URL where you have the articles and stuff. That's great, but I would prefer to have the user manual access directly on a device as well because they don't have to then access another device in order to look up something or something like that. So that's the overview of the settings, the sidebars and 
basically just how you navigate the device itself. All right, so now let's do a quick look, uh, not super deep look into the um, functionality of the uh, the PDF reader. So the PDF reader, uh, you have your swipe gestures as you've seen before. It doesn't work with the tap, it has to be a swipe, right? So it's not a tap or a swipe, it's just a swipe. And you also have the ability to change that swipe functionality with this icon here. It can be, oh, sorry, yeah, you do have a tap. So if it's on a swipe icon, it will work with a swipe with one finger. If you have two fingers and swipe, then that will, uh, sorry, I didn't activate it. There we go. So if you have two fingers, then it's no longer going to react to this. When would you want that? It's going to be a two fingered swipe. Well, this is basically like an insurance policy to make sure that the device doesn't accidentally interpret your palm as a swipe. Now, granted, this has been really, really improved on the A6X2, but in case that you are still encountering that, I recommend that you try out the uh, two fingered swipe because that's usually how I like to use it. And then there's virtually no chance of the device misinterpreting the sliding of your palm over the top of the screen as a swipe page and as a consequence you minimize the accidental swipes to basically never happening and you also have the option to actually tap so you do have an option to tap for the next page but one thing that i've noticed is that the responsiveness i don't know if it's just a personal impression because the gesture itself lasts uh less so tap is a much faster gesture so i'm done and then i wait for the device to flip a page. Whereas in if I am on a swipe and I do a swipe, no, 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 it, it's faster. Definitely, it's not just an impression. So for some reason, swipes are a lot more responsive and faster. Whereas in if I change to the tap, it's faster, uh, it's, it is responsive, but my personal impression is that the, um, sorry, I need to, this is a very strange angle that I'm sitting at. So, so my personal impression, at least how it feels is that is the device is a lot more responsive uh, in flipping pages when using swipe gestures or let's try the two swipe, two finger swipe. Yeah, exactly the same type of responsiveness. So um, yeah, that's your pages navigation. Then I've already shown with the toolbar, you can double tap anywhere on the screen to show and hide it. And you can double tap on the middle of the empty page here to expose the document name and where you are in the page. If you tap the page number here, then you can use this slider here to navigate, but you can also use this one to navigate where you want, or you can use much more to swap to kind of go through a lot more pages, right? So you can kind of go really, really a lot. And then when you get to close where you want, you can just get exactly, let's say 125, that's the page I want to, and there we go. But it will not do the function that you saw in general view. It will only be when you're in the page overview here. So why is that? Well, because the default functionality is undo so, so that swipe down is redo swipe up is undo and that lends itself to be extremely useful because you can uh you can write on documents right and then maybe i can i want to undo that line or no nah, i like the line so i'm just gonna whoops and then i'm just gonna redo now what about other stuff so let's for, for the second portion, let's flip over here. And um, you can definitely select text, but you can't click, you can't hold and select. Doesn't work like that on the, uh, on the super note. Um, and this is the thing that I have a problem with. So the two fingered er eraser gesture, right? It should work with placing two fingers and having this, but I don't have it. Like more often than not, in this case, it's going to be a selecting thing. So for the screen, I simply find that the two fingers on the screen for the gesture doesn't really work for me. That's why I prefer the button. But the good news is that two fingers on the sidebar works pretty much 
without any problem every single time. I have yet to find an example when it actually fails. Whereas in, if I'm doing this, okay, so that one was good. Let's uh, undo, there we go, let's try again. Okay, now it works. <laughs> so sometimes it works, but for me, I find that the two fingers on the sidebar, on the second sidebar or the left-hand sidebar, just is far more reliable. Maybe if I write down here, I'm trying to replicate the undo redo, there we go. So if I really put intentionally a lot of pressure down here and then I slide, I, I'm trying, I got one redo, okay, less, I, I can't, I, I mean, when I'm normally using it, my posture and the way that I write simply doesn't interact with this. And I only managed to get one redo here and that was only when I was pressing intentionally here and trying to get it to do that. Uh, when I'm normally using it, I don't get that problem, but just something to kind of be aware of. Now, back on track. Um, in the toolbar here, you have the access to, of course, documents. Then uh, this here would be your table of contents, where you can choose from your table of contents. You have your keywords that you've added, your bookmarks, your annotations and highlights. All of these things can be found uh, here as an overview of the, uh, of the document here. You have your needle point pen, right? Which can be of different thickness. Then you have your, it's called ink pen, which is pressure sensitive. So needle point is not pressure sensitive. So it's always the same. Ink pen, definitely pressure sensitive. And then we can undo and undo, yeah. Uh, then we have a marker, I believe, yes, which is a lot thicker, see, a lot, lot, lot thicker, but still super responsive. Then we have the highlighter. The highlighter is not the highlighter that you would mean. It's not, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It's basically for selecting the text and it works really well. And once you select it, then you can choose. It can be just a highlight. It can be an underline. It can be a digest, which means that if I choose it to be a digest, then it turns into a digest and then I can add my notes here into the whole thing. So basically a very complete, complete kind of a uh, thing. But it is a little bit misleading if somebody thinks that, oh, it, highlighter is just highlighting text. No, it's actually for selecting the text. So I would call that text selector tool, and then you can choose what you want it to be. And then you can also add like a comment on it as well, on the selection that you want. There was a question where somebody was like, hey, I accidentally made these things. Um, and how do I remove them, right? So let's say this is a highlight, this is a comment with no comment and that's it. And then maybe I want to uh, remove this. The way to remove this is actually really easy. There's two ways to do it. You can either tap on it with a finger and then just delete. Or if you are in the text selection or highlighter tool, you can tap on it with the pen and then delete. Then we have an eraser, which can have uh, different types of brushes or thicknesses with a pressure sensitivity. We have a region eraser, we have a lasso tool, undo, redo, touch that we've talked about. And then we have a little bit more options here. And we have the options to erase all, uh, add a keyword, add a bookmark, search through the document. You can trim the size of the page, adjust the con uh, contrast that we've talked about export the document and add the uh, two quick access. So the quick access is what we've talked about here. So these are the quick access uh, things and you can add either the current page to the quick access of this document or the entire document to the entire uh, to the quick access. So in this case I added the page and you can see that this is the document. This is the page and that's what we have here. And the way it works is you can easily swap from one document and then I can just go back here exactly to the page that I actually wanted. The way to remove it is that if you're on the same page, you can just remove it. You have the preferences. 
for the documents. So you have the uh, show digest symbols as A or D, like annotation or a digest. Um, star mark recognition, you can draw a star and then it makes a star and that's searchable. Page number bar position, do you want it on the bottom or on the top? And then buttons displayed on the shortened floating toolbar, which are the buttons that you want to display. And now we're gonna cover the toolbar functionality so that you can see how that works and what does that mean. So let's say that I want pen and eraser, or actually pen and lasso, because I'm going to use this as an eraser. So let's uh, let's move like this. So it's a little bit easier. All right. So with the toolbar, before I start showing other stuff, you have the uh, final options of moving the toolbar. So the toolbar can be anywhere you want. On the top, it can be on the bottom, it can be on the side or either of the sides. So fully customizable and fully, uh, yeah, you can just sort it any way that you want and it will just do that what you want. Now you also have an option of uh, pressing and holding until the arrow appears. And once you actually have that arrow appear and you move the tool bar here, you can see that it becomes a floating toolbar. And with a floating toolbar, you can move it here. If I want to dock it up, it will automatically understand that it, it docks all the way up. But if you slide it from the top, then it's gonna go, it's gonna turn into a horizontal option. And you have the option here of switching it, hey, you want it vertical or horizontal orientation, right? So that's that. And then you have this icon here, which is going to collapse it or expand it. So this is going to collapse it or expand it. So for example, you want it, if you wanted to, you could have like a very minimal uh, setup here. The only thing that I'm not like a super fan of is that I would love to have this just here in the upper corner and not dock, but you can't that you can't do that. So you need to keep it like there and then it works. And these are the tools that we talked about what you can do and you have the undo and redo here. So those are the operations that you have uh, with the toolbar. Uh, there we go. Again, apologies, the angle at which I'm actually doing this, I can't really see where I'm pressing. So I'm just kind of guessing. <laughs> so I'll miss the press uh, a lot of the times. Um, so yeah, you also do have the option to pay, uh, pinch to zoom. Now pinch to zoom is not that responsive. It's actually fairly slow. But and at first it may seem like it's um, difficult to use, which it may be true because it doesn't really allow for easy uh, adjustments, right? It, it's very kind of funky how to use it. But what I've come to realize is that once you actually train yourself there is a way for you to uh, understand where to do the gestures so that you can actually get the zoom in to be a lot more uh, effective uh, out of the first uh, first go. And once you have it zoomed in, then you can just simply uh, close the zoom thing and it will stay there. And you can flip pages in that zoom level if you wanted to. So for example, if I wanted to, I could um, zoom in, let's say a little bit less, something like this. And maybe I wanted this, let's zoom a little bit less. So it's all covered. Yeah. So maybe this is the type of zoom level that I want. And then I can flip pages and I can read my document through that. So that is also something that you can uh, do, but does pinch to zoom it's there. Uh, it doesn't really work that well. So that's a quick overview of the functionalities and what you can actually do with this. And one important note, the handwriting, uh, uh, handwriting itself. So this is my test. Uh, while you can find it um, here, so for example, in annotations, I can find it. There's no way to do handwriting recognition here. So you can't search your handwriting recognition that you do in documents, which is something that uh, usually people do ask when they try to use and they use uh, MDO, um, which is my daily organizer that I have. So for example, we are now this is Monday 22nd that I'm writing this. And um, yep, yeah, if I uh, made some entries here of um, yeah, my my writing, and naturally, somebody would want to try and do a search of your handwriting 
content that you've added, you can't do that if the document is in the document mode because you can find your annotations, you can see them, but you can't do text recognition because Supernote does not have that functionality. But there is a way around it. More on that when we get to the notebook section. So this um, kind of concludes the overview of the uh, document uh, functionality itself. And I think that it's super easy and super, super nice. One of the things that I haven't covered is uh, if you have a hyperlink document like this one, you can uh, use the previous and back arrows and you can go navigate that well uh, that way as well. That's not really necessary on the MDO because it's entirely hyperlinked, but in other documents, it's a really good thing that you have them. And unlike with the Remarkable 2 where you have that option, but only for a limited amount of time, this is constantly available there. So all you need to do is double tap at the bottom for your page bar and then that's where you have it. As far as writing latency or writing speed on the Supernote A6 X2, when I started writing it felt completely immediate and super super fast. So when I did the test, uh, uh, test I was not surprised to see it actually share the first place and be exactly the same as fast as the Note Air 3C is, which is currently the champion, where all they are now sharing the first spot because they both clock in at 17.54 milliseconds of writing speed latency, which makes both the Super Note A6 X2 and the Note Air 3C devices with the fastest writing latency currently on the market. And that's such a nice thing, especially when you combine it with the ceramic nib, the 0.3 millimeter thing, you are actually feel a little bit more connected to the whole thing and it just feels so so good and so immediate and so consistently good that's one of the differences between the note air 3c and this one is basically the consistency on the note air 3c sometimes because of the software it it does vary a tiny bit and then it averages out to the same amount but this one like rock solid constantly all of the time and that just is something that you feel when you're writing it just feels really really immediate surface to screen distance on the supernote a6 x2 is under one millimeter so i think it's around 0.9 millimeters which is actually really good it's not as good as we have it on the quaderno or the sony dpt or the um yeah now defunct uh quirk logic paper uh those were the absolute best ones nothing comes close because that's like literally like writing on the screen that's the best feel that you can have but this one does have layers so it does have that thin glass layer and then it has this feel right to on top of it and that adds the thickness but it still adds less of a thickness than what you will have on a regular uh, front lid device which is around 1 to 1.1 millimeters here it's about to 0 0.9 or maybe even 0 0.9 8 somewhere around there but definitely it feels really really good um, and connected to the device when you're writing on it and the surface itself the, the the resistance of the surface when i measured it it measured to be at around 20.23 percent of the resistance of writing on a paper with an equal nib so that is uh, something that's a good result definitely a good result but here we need to talk a little bit about the feel right two. It's a significant change to the feel right one that we had on Supernote A5 and on Supernote A5X and A6X. So feel right two is supposed to be more paper like, and it is. It's uh, more rougher and maybe a little bit more paper like, but I don't think that it resembles paper like feel. I don't think that it even resembles paper like screen protectors that you use, that, that some devices use, or the paper-like surface that I experienced on the Remarkable 2, or on the Note Air 3C, or on the Note Air 3, or on the Kindle Scribe, or on the Cowboy Ellipse 2, or whatever. Those all feel in a certain way, they're raspy, and they feel on a certain way. This is raspy, but feels different. And I think that the issue why it feels different is that it's a strange combination that I couldn't really get my head around. And there is uh, several aspects that you need to kind of keep in mind when thinking about the feel right too. So 
The first one is my first impression when I started writing on the A6X2. I believe I even mentioned it. It feels a little harder, but slippery. And that is my writing style. I don't have a lot of pressure, writing pressure. So that is how I write. So my initial thing is how much pressure is the screen going to give me? It gives some, but the combination with the, um, with the ceramic nib, then I eliminated. Oh, it was the hardness that I was feeling. That was the ceramic nib because if I would take the pen with a soft nib, then it felt softer, right? And then it was okay. But the slipperiness thing was there. It's rough, as you can hear, definitely, roughness is there, but so is the slipperiness. And then came something really strange, which was actually an email and a comment from one person who said like, and there was actually two people who said like, oh, it feels incredibly sticky and huge resistance, which was like the complete opposite of what I'm experiencing. What I'm experiencing is slipperiness, right? It's a little bit more too slippery for my taste. And here are these people saying like, no, it's like super resistant. And it took me a while to actually figure out what's happening until I remembered, hey, this is a surface that gives. And when you start writing with a lot of pressure, and I'm saying a lot, when you start writing super heavy, then the surface starts to exhibit some type of stickiness. So when, if you're writing star in, you have a really, really heavy hand, and I'm talking about very heavy hand, pressing quite hard, this no longer feels slippery or effortless. It feels jaggedy. I don't know if you can see. So if I'm pressing hard, it's not slipping. This is light and this is pressing hard. I can't do a smooth line. So that is something that you absolutely, you won't damage the surface because it's designed to kind of bounce back. Uh, but you will not have a good writing experience if you have a really, really heavy hand. And when you're writing and you're pressing really hard, then the feel right will behave weird. It will give this uh sudden bursts of resistance and then give so resistance and give so it's kind of holding it and then when you start moving the pressure distributes to kinetic energy from potential to kin kinetic and then suddenly you have a little bit of a slipperiness until your pressure kind of presses again and then it's like pfft, stuck again so that took a long time for me to figure out uh, what are these users talking about what it is that they are ex experiencing because it was diametrically opposite of what I'm experiencing and only when I started doing that did I finally manage to pinpoint and experience exactly the thing that they are experiencing and objectively if this is your writing style and this is the only thing that you feel then this feels bad this will feel bad because it's not smooth it's not consistent it's sticky it's grippy it's weird but if you feel, if you write with a light hand or you are willing to train yourself to write much more easily and lightly, then you have a different feel and then it's a much, much more pleasant and consistent experience, really, really consistent. But even then, for my personal taste, while I do prefer it over the um, feel right one that we had on Super Note A6X, it's not as nice or as pleasant as what I have on the Note Air 3C or on the Note Air 3. So what I then decided to do was kind of fire up my microscope and take a look at the uh, feel right one and feel right two primarily to see what the differences are. And then I noticed that, of course, there's a difference in pattern and how much of a roughness there is. And that's something that you can definitely see in this footage at different kind of zoomed levels. And also that slipperiness uh, is uh, really kind of down to a lot of hardness and the slipperiness does come down to the ceramic nib because then I put it also under the microscope. And then you can see the comparison of, of just how smooth the edges and precise the nib of the hard metal 2 or the standard super note ceramic nib is when you compare it to a worn uh slightly worn and then heavily worn 
uh, soft felt nibs. So then once I saw that, <laughs> the difference, it makes sense why there's less resistance when using this nib and a ceramic nib and why there's more resistance. So it comes down to a personal preference. My personal preference is basically soft nibs on a Note Air 3C or a Note Air 3 type of surface. Um, but this definitely feels good. But whenever I switch from Note Air 3C onto this one, I do get those two distinct kind of notes of mm, slightly harder and slightly more slippery. Why am I talking about this all so much? Well, because you can't just go into the store and try it, right, for yourself and see it. And it's a big expense and it's a lot of things. And if you, uh, and if you decide to return it, you don't get the import fees back. You don't get the shipping fees back. You don't get the storage fees. So you get a partial refund basically. So, and it's a lot of money. So I'm trying to explain as best as I can what I see here and how it actually feels. So overall conclusion, feel right too. How does it feel? It feels excellent. It writes excellent, but it's a little bit specific and I would not characterize it just as paper-like. I prefer it over Remarkable 2, definitely, because Remarkable 2 is imprecise and it's way too hard. For my taste, it's like super hard, especially now after using these devices for such a long time and not using Remarkable 2 for a long time. And then when I go back to it, oof, it's, it's like really, really hard surface to write on and doesn't have any GIF and I don't like it at all. Scratchiness? I like the scratchiness on Remarkable 2, for example, better, but I like the Note Air 3 or Note Air 3C scratchiness way better than any of them. It's like super, super nice. And you have that a little bit of slipperiness to kind of consider with the light handwriting, only if you're using the uh, ceramic nib. So, okay, I know it was a long-winded kind of explanation, but hopefully it helps some of you kind of understand a little bit better what to expect from uh, the writing experience and the surface of the Feelwrite 2 on the Supernote A6X2. All right, so I'm gonna open up the example note that I started with and let's just uh, erase this whole thing. One of the things that's really cool is that uh, about Supernote is the user interface and user experience consistency. What I mean by that is that everything that you've applied, learned to use on a document, it automatically applies in a notebook, right? So double tap on the page numbers, double tap here, everything works the same. So if you press and hold, you can detach, you can put it there, you can dock it up, you can dock it down, you can collapse it, you can expand it. It's exactly the same functionality as you'd have, uh, and more importantly, user experience that you have across the device, whether it's a document or a notebook so that you don't have to hunt down where the options are and what you actually need to do or not do. And that's really something where books, for example, fails miserably because it just changes the experience completely. And it has multiple toolbars for multiple things, which is completely unnecessary. We have more tools, different tools and everything. So the toolbar is a little bit different. So um, yeah, this, is my example writing right so that's just a normal type of example of writing so that i can show you how that works and then you can have your uh different brushes here uh, same type of brushes um so you have needle pen you have ink pen you have marker and you don't have the text selection tool or the highlighter because you don't have text capabilities in uh, the uh, notebook. Instead, you have your eraser, region eraser, erase the whole page. So this, dog, this uh, icon here is to erase the whole page. We have the lasso tool, more on it a little bit later. We have our layers and the layers can be renamed. They can be reorganized and you can have five additional layers on top and the background layer with this icon, this is your template, right? So if you want to change the template, you can access the change to the template either through layers and then the background layer here. Or you also have the convenience of tapping this icon here directly, which is your access to the templates. Uh, then we have the page overview here. So yeah, that's my pages. And um, it's not the same as here where the page navigation is. This is basically, this is gonna have different tools, what you can actually do with a page. So if I long press a select a page, I can, and if I had a notebook with multiple pages, I can select multiple pages and change the template on the selection 
or I can insert a blank page before the selection, after the selection, I can copy, I can paste it and I can move it to another notebook or I can delete the page. Undo, redo, templates, uh, yeah. Then we can uh, we can remove the page, that's page with the minus, remove the page. Um, we have the same type of navigation stuff, you can use this, except that no, you can't actually, there's no tapping. So that's why I mixed it up. So no tapping in notebooks, tapping is available on the documents, okay? Or no touch at all. Uh, if you're using no touch, just to think, you can use uh, this one here to actually add a new, new pages added by flipping to the next page uh, effortlessly and you can navigate like this. So you can completely disable touch and then you don't have, uh, if, if that's what your preference is. More options and in more options, we indeed have more options. Uh, first of all, uh, toolbar, same exact functionality as before. I'm not going to show it here because it's the same thing. Uh, quick access, same exact thing as before. Export as a PDF vector or uh, bitmap based. You can copy current page, you can cut current page, you can insert page before after. So you have those shortcuts as well from the page over notebook overview, you have them here as well. And you can also add a keyword, insert the link, set cover for the notebook and rename the notebook. And we have preferences here. And in the preferences, we have handwriting anti-aliasing that you can turn on or off, star mark recognition and configuration for the page number bar position and the shortened and extended uh, yeah, setting for the toolbar itself. Comprehensive options, but very consistent and very, very easy to figure out. The only other thing that you have is also gesture settings here, where you can have full screen, you can add, hide exit full screen button, or you can show it if when you're in full screen. So that looks like this. So if I'm in full screen, so sorry, uh, when I'm in full screen, and this, then you will have the exit full screen button, right? So that's how that works. But I, since I'm used to it and I use the double uh, uh, gesture thing, I choose to hide it, right? Then we have the page number bar. Yeah, if you, if you want that double tap or not, and you can return to page before jumping, you can swipe up with one finger from the top half of the screen. So that uh, applies to something else and we're gonna cover that, uh, well, actually now, because uh, let's, let's expose this and let's add, um, this is page number two, uh, page number three, my final page. Okay, here's the thing that you can do. There's some advanced stuff, really, really advanced stuff that only Supernote as a platform has on a notebooks and it creates it like a super powerful tool. And that is basically your selector lasso tool. So chapter 1.1, and then I'm gonna have chapter uh, 1.2. And if I then go into my lasso or use the shortcut, depending on what you want, I can make a selection. And once you make a selection, of course you can move it, you can scale it, you can do all that stuff. You can copy it, you can paste it, you can move it to another page, you can cut it, that's for cut and paste. You can add this as an event in your calendar. You can add this as a keyword, which is then searchable. And then you can also add it as a head, heading, which was previously known as titles, and you can add it as a link. Now, the heading and links are very specific. I mean, all of these are useful, but the heading and links are super useful for one really particular reason. So if I add a heading and convert this to a heading, and I'm gonna do this as well, and convert this to a heading type as well. Um, here is going to be my um, I need to write my page and my page four and let's say two. Okay, so those are the things that I'm adding here. So what does the heading thing do? Well, the heading thing is super cool as an organizational tool because it allows you to basically start creating your own table of contents in your own notebook which is then easily navigatable. Now, this doesn't really matter because they're both on the same page. But the thing is, once you start adding this and you check through your headings, my notebooks tend to grow into hundreds of pages. And I use this as 
a way to easily navigate and organize this. And on top of that, you can search your keywords and you can search your stars. That is power number one for the headings and the titles. Now the power number two are of course the links and the links are, um, it's, it's gonna be a basic example here. But I'm gonna expand it a little bit more. So this is a basic example. I'm gonna insert the link. And when you're inserting a link, first you choose the link style, how you want it to look like. I just want it to be underlined. Um, and it can be a link to another page in the current file can be a link to recent files, other files and web page, and then you can choose. So for example, other page here. So this is going to link to my page. Okay, I was supposed to move. Well, then move it. So I can just move it a little bit down so I can select things more easily. There we go. Let's select a number two as well. That would have helped. All right, so add a link. And I wanna add a link to another page. Um, but I don't want to add to page two. I actually want to add another page after it and I want to link to it. And then I'm going to go OK. And now if I tap on it, it's going to take me uh, to my new page. And I can go back to where I come from, uh, either by using these icons or that gesture that we've talked about that you can swipe up from the middle and up, right? So if I go to page four, this is my final page. Now it's page four or five because we inserted one and I can swipe up and then it goes back or you can use these icons here to go back where you came from. But I can also go to my MDO, right? I can actually say like, okay, so this is gonna be a hyperlink that goes all the way to my MDO and I'm just gonna go recent files, right? And I've used MDO, so this is gonna be a link to my MDO and then I go back to where it is. And it's gonna open up where it was, you know, to begin with and when it went, where it was. And the cool thing about these is that I can just go back and it's gonna go back to where I came from. So it remembers like your navigation, jumping between all of these documents and what you're doing. It's super, super easy to overlook, but it's incredibly powerful. But what, what would be also really cool is if we had that same gesture to flip from the middle up to actually have that consistency system-wide, not just in the notebooks, but the middle gesture is just for the notebooks. So when you combine all of this, it, it turns into an incredibly powerful tool. And Supernote has another ace up its sleeve, and that is if you have a hyperlinked PDF file, such as MDO or an my, my Deep Guide Meeting Planner or MMP, and you copy those to the My Style fo uh, folder on your Supernote. So in this case, I have two of them, single and this one. I'm gonna be using the single one. You can actually use and convert your notebook uh, into using those pages from that PDF file, but also maintaining hyperlinks because of the link functionality and it does it all on its own. However, uh, in order to make that work, you can't just uh, select a template from creation of the notebook. And then I go to, as you would expect, right? Customization, you won't see them there. Actually, that's because this is a notebook functionality, that conversion. So what you need to do is first create any template. It doesn't really matter. Just create the type of notebook that you want. And once it's created, then you go into the templates from within the notebook itself and you go to customization and then you will see the PDFs that were added. So in this case, I'm gonna add this single one and it's gonna say, hey, this is a 12 page PDF file, okay? So I select all of them and I'm just gonna say apply as a template. It's gonna process and this is an example of how long it takes in real time for a 12 page document. And now you actually have a uh, PDF document with hyperlinks but as a notebook, right? So all my hyperlinks here will work as they did on the uh, PDF. Granted, it's a tiny bit slower than on the PDF, but it's still, uh, the benefit of it is it grants you the ability to add links, all the stuff that we've talked about, all of the benefits uh, of the tools that you have on your notebooks, such as headings, links, keywords, all of that kind of stuff you can actually use here 
Um, and furthermore, if you actually use this in a handwriting conversion type of a notebook, which is something that you can do, then you can also convert the handwriting that you use in this one. And that's the way that you can circumvent. And Supernote is the only platform that allows you that way to circumvent of how would you search your handwritten notes in a PDF file? Well, you can't do it in a PDF file, but you can convert the PDF file into a notebook and then you can actually do that search. And while we're on it, word pages, I'm not gonna go into that, but you can actually create uh, Word documents and then you can type in them and then you can do select them and you can do my script operations with the gestures and things like that. I, I, you, you definitely have that, but I don't have time or room for uh, doing that and the Atelier, uh, I've already covered in detail uh, for the update to 12 and I'm not gonna be covering it here. That's a drawing app. You can just check out my video for the update of uh, 2.12 and you'll see all of it there in detail. So that's not gonna be covered in this video either. The last thing I wanna do with the notebooks is let's create a real-time recognition notebook. Uh, so this one is going to be um, recognition uh, test. Okay, so we're gonna do that. And when you're in here, um, you have majority of the similar icons, but not all of them are exactly the same. So um, let's just write something. And this is going to be also serving as a writing example. And while you have most of the functionalities here, um, you have one that's new one, and that is that A text and the I thing. And you can see that it's already done it in the background. And it says, this is my writing example on the A6X2. It recognized everything, but it doesn't understand that that's the name, but it recognized every symbol uh, correctly. It is nice, comma, very nice to write on, comma, not really paper-like, comma, but still, comma, feels very good and natural to write on, full stop. And it just recognized it really, really great. But as I said, it will drain the battery uh, faster. I didn't measure by how much because it will depend how much you use it because it's continually detecting when you write new stuff, then it's there and then you have to kind of, yeah, look into that. You also have another icon here, which is the lookup or search. And then I can just say like paper. Uh, let's do paper search really paper like but still right so you can do handwriting recognition search and then i go here and then i have a search system-wide search and can i just say like not file but oh you can okay so system-wide you can go handwriting and then i can go uh, but yes. And then it's going to tell you in which note, where did you find the word? So you can actually do the system wide recognition as well. The only thing you need to do is swipe down global search and then you can choose, hey, I want to search in a file, keyword, star or handwriting. And then it's going to search through all of your handwriting recognition notebooks. Incredibly, incredibly powerful. Before I wrap things up, I'm just gonna do a very quick check of Kindle, even though I've done that before, but just a quick overview here. You can see the examples and I've showed how Kindle works uh, on, on, on Supernote several times, but uh, yeah, just, just to kinda show it here in this video as well. Yes, the Kindle works and uh, you do have the option of viewing it as a full page or one panel per page. 
and this is how that works and of course the uh, orientation also works there as well and that's how it works for comics and if I switch back so that would be I always forget how do you exit from uh, there we go there so we can exit in a normal book which is a text-based book works as you would normally have it and yep that's pretty much that you can change the themes you can do everything that you can normally do with an android kindle app well okay that was a lot of work and <laughs> i'm tired but still we gotta go through the conclusion and as usual uh we're gonna go through cons first for the a6x2 and here the first one that i'm gonna give as a con that one's also gonna be a pro as well and that's gonna be the feel right to uh surface if your writing habits are that you have a very heavy hand feel right to will not feel good and some users have reported that you have that inconsistent high resistance low resistance type of thing and that's because of the surface of how it is so if you naturally have a very heavy hand when writing and you are not willing or interested to adapt and maybe start to learn how to write with a lighter touch then you will experience uh, feel right to as a negative experience for writing the access to the micro sd card slot while on the regular white version it's not a big deal at all it's normal you pop the cover and you back up and then it's all fine on the crystal version it is a pain to uh, reach it because you have to unscrew what was it 18 screws which is not a problem uh, and then put it on the problem is putting it back up because of that power button everything i talked about in the intro so the uh, solution and the placement of the micro sd card slot is not really practical for the crystal version of the a6x2 on the regular white version it's totally fine for some this is going to be a con worth mentioning for me it's not but this is a device that does not have a front light so that's something that you have to be aware of so you need to adapt your environmental lighting so that it can work just like a piece of paper or a book would um, in terms of performance this is not something that i would characterize as a blisteringly fast or super fast device it's not super slow but it's definitely always super note has always been on the slower side of things normal to slower so if you're expecting like crazy blistering speeds like the uh, tab ultra c pro or note air 3c like you know the, the refresh rates and things like that you're not gonna get that here it is responsive, it is normally responsive for a normal e-ink device and sometimes it can be a little bit slower so it's something to definitely keep in mind. Pinch to zoom is definitely not working the way I would want it and I think that it needs uh, quite a bit more work as far as the regular stuff goes. It's one of the things that's kind of missing because everything else functions so well but the pinch to zoom is then it's like really really like a sore point but it's something that definitely can be uh, a regular type of tool that you want to use all the time and it's something that's a little bit slower and fiddly to use on the supernote uh, platform a6x2 included and definitely this is not a cheap device we've discussed the price range so from 400 and it can go up all the way almost up to 500 us dollars when you fully spec it up with the crystal and the cover and a expensive pen you get uh, really close to 500 and you add the import fees and then you cross 500 so it's an expensive device definitely and you don't have an option to try it out so yeah definitely a lot to think about but you do get a lot for your money but, but then again it's a really a lot of money for a small device that that is sluggish and it does have some kind of things but it, it all comes down to what your needs are if well we'll save that for the conclusion let's go on the pros now and now on to the pros of the supernote a6x2 uh, and the pro uh, again is going to be that feel right to surface if you are a normal to light handed uh writer so that you don't have a heavy handed uh, heavy hand when writing so that you don't have a ton of pressure then that you're just normal to light then this will feel really really good i think it's a significant improvement over the um a feel right one and i prefer it definitely it's not a hundred percent up to my 
taste, but it might be 100% up to somebody else's taste. But generally speaking, overall, I think that it feels really, really good if you have a normal to light pressure when writing. I am a very, very big fan of the new X2, um, yeah, the, the, the thinking of modularity and easily accessible reparation of your device that will extend its longevity. So that is a huge, huge pro for either the uh, regular or the crystal version. On the crystal version, I'm absolutely adoring the design itself overall. It's just such a gorgeous device that it's it's something that just brings you joy or me it brings me joy every time i interact with it and anyone who has watched my videos will know that my preferences are a balance of practical and emotional and for me a device needs to do something emotional to me and this one does this one makes me happy this one makes me excited this one makes me want to interact with it and it just works really really well Overall, objectively, not emotionally, but objectively, the build quality is exceptionally good, especially for a plastic device. The precision of fitting and everything is just really, really good. And I don't know that I've ever seen a full-on plastic device that was actually built this well and this precise. I'm, I'm struggling to find like a, an example, when did I find something? I didn't know that you can actually do it like that. I thought that this level of precision and consistency is reserved for metal and glass, but I'm wrong because this one, they've managed that for sure. And it just feels like a really premium and special product. It's just really does feel special in the hand. I love the ergonomics of it. The fact that you have the perfect symmetry and you have these two stripes and you have the auto rotation, it just completes the experience into a completely seamless transition and the combination of the, uh, the tools and how the OS works, that it does most of the work for you, that you don't have to think about fitting the page, doing this, doing that. No, you, all you do is rotate it this way and continue working and the device in the system does the rest, absolutely excellent. The overall uh, SuperNote system, so reader functionalities, notebook functionalities, uh, recognition functionalities, all of it. I could make an individual video that would last probably half an hour or even more gushing over and listing why I love all of the things that the SuperNote platform has, but in this one I'm just going to wrap it up as a ginormous positive that outweighs probably all of the other positives basically because at the end of the day you're using the device as pretty as it is and all unquestionably that's all important but what good is it if it doesn't actually deliver and doesn't offer you things to use it to improve your daily life and functionality and this one does on so many levels uh, it's it's an incredible combination of deep functionality and deep uh, uh, abilities that are very, very serious, but to maintain them in such a simple way and such a distraction-free way and so organized and in a way intuitive, you only need to learn just the mentality of the device once and that applies pretty much to the entirety of the device and entirety of the platform and then before you know it you feel at home so yes you do need to put in the bare minimum of an effort to actually learn and be interested enough to actually learn how a device functions and if you do that this one will reward you in in a very very big way excellent writing latency and there's honestly there's a lot more pros and i i can't even think of that i mean it's like has an sd card slot yes it's positioned badly that is a con but it does have an SD card slot, and if you're not of a user that's gonna want to flip and change their libraries there, and you just want extended storage, then you have like two terabytes of additional storage on this one, which is like, you, you really have plenty then to work with. It's very seamless. You just, you know, format it as an NTFS and put it in the device and that's it. The only thing I didn't have a chance to actually test is I don't know if the system has the ability to format the card itself. If it doesn't, it should. But yeah, I didn't have a chance to check that out. But overall, let's try and summarize uh, this one. And um, quite frankly, 
This is an incredibly important device and a very, very important achievement that Rata has managed. I did not expect it to be anything more than an iterative upgrade, especially because Rata was under selling it and it said like, well, it's just a quad core, it's the same specifications, we're just refreshing it and we're focusing on this modular thing, but ultimately it's gonna be the same thing. And then all of a sudden we get the second one, we get the gray outline, we get the symmetry, we get the auto rotation, we get the magnets in combination with the mechanical, we get the SD card slot, we get the crystal version as well, we get so many things that are just in such elegant harmony that I think that's the only thing is just this device feels harmonious, well balanced, well thought out, and it just is a complete joy to use. Uh, cheesy, but it, it fits there for those who write. So yeah, hopefully this long video in-depth review and guide will help you understand if the Supernote A6X2 is the right device for you or not. For me, it absolutely a thousand percent is, despite me not being fully on board with the feel of the feel right too. But still, I don't care about that enough to actually put me off of everything else that is a humongous positive of the A6X2. So simply put, um, it, it, it's an absolutely fantastic device. So if you find yourself in that you identify yourself as somebody who writes a lot and reads and does have needs to uh, have plenty of, I don't know, study, research, annotations on the documents and then interaction with the documents and notebooks and have a complex way of interlinking them and basically do all of those things. I mean, for studying and for research work and just for writing, this is absolutely fantastic. This is not trying to be an iPad replacement. This is not trying to be a books replacement. This is not trying to be an Android tablet. This is what it says it is. This is for people who read and who write and as such, it delivers fantastically. But if you're looking for that type of traditional Android experience, then you need to look elsewhere because this is not it. All right, that's it. I hope that you enjoyed the video and that you found it useful. If you did, please like and subscribe and ding the notification channel on the bottom here to get notified when new videos come out on my deep guide. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy and see you in the next video. Bye.